Excellent. I just have a few housekeeping items. Um, if folks could put their phones or computers on mute during the presentation, uh, that would really help us. It's much better, and there's no feedback. For folks with desk phones, I think it's star six to mute and unmute. And maybe at the end, we'll unmute everyone for questions and answers. Uh, and as Ned said, we are recording this webinar. We can share it with others. And I'd like to get going and and, uh -oh, and introduce uh, today's session about recycling biosolids and the benefits. Uh, those of you who do it know it's not the easiest or the cheapest way to manage biosolids, but it is the most beneficial and the most sustainable approach. Today's webinar will remind us about why we go to all this trouble, time and effort spent recycling biosolids. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, we hope you learn a lot about the benefits of recycling biosolids and that it encourages all of you to keep promoting and keep advocating for beneficial reuse of biosolids. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, everyone knows Ned Beecher. His name is synonymous with Nebra. He was the first executive director um, when Nebra was founded in 1998. He served in that position for over two decades before they brought me on board. He's led Nebra's efforts to bring science and common sense to PFAS regulations. He was one of the first ones to recognize early on the impact this would have on biosolids management. Uh, currently, he's coordinating research and special projects for Nebra. He's authored numerous articles, book chapters, papers, presentations on biosolids management in the Northeast and all across the country. He has an MS from Antioch University in resource management, and his bachelor's degree was in geology from Amherst College. Without further ado, I would like to have Ned take over the role, and I am going to enjoy listening. Great. Thank you, Janine, and thanks to everybody who's joining. As I mentioned earlier, this is being recorded and will be available um, to share. Hopefully, it comes out well. I'm trying to do a variety of different things here, um, mostly uh, go through all the happy memories I have of the many amazing biosolids projects I've seen over the years. And uh, I will um, uh, share what, what bits I know. It's a little haphazard. It's going to be just a, a barrage of uh, uh, information, um, but it'll be available in going forward. So um, please uh, use the chat function, which is uh, available in order to uh, ask questions or raise your hand or get game enthusiasm. Um, hopefully, uh, everybody's being able to hear this okay. And um, we will, uh, Janine, give me the thumbs up if things look good. Okay, and um, so we'll jump right into it. I'll mention um, that NEBRA, is a uh, organization, a regional organization here in the Northeast that tries to help uh, encourage the recycling of biosolids, uh, providing information for our profession as well as uh, to the general public and the media and anyone who will listen, uh, essentially. Um, we offer tours and workshops and newsletters and we track uh, research and legislation and regulation development um, helping on so, um, okay, what about this recycling? Well, uh, NEBRA uh, has a lot of resources on our website. Um, this is your res resource. The basic concept of biosolids recycling, uh, which is available on our Biosol About Biosolids webpage, is, uh, is shown in this diagram here. Essentially, uh, we, have, uh, we borrow water from the environment, and we use it and uh, wastewater is created because we dirty that water. Uh, it then goes through uh, either septic systems or wastewater treatment facilities, also known as water resource recovery facilities. And then how those solids are that, that come out of there are treated and managed is what we're all about. That's where the energy is 
that's where uh, there's nutrients and other materials that can be recovered. So renewable energy can be extracted from the solids in anaerobic digestion. The solids can be converted to biosolids, fertilizers, and soil amendments, and then they can be recycled to soils, bringing those to the farms and soils where they were generated previously. The clean water is returned to the natural systems, and uh, then the cycle continues in in inevitably forever, essentially. So the last thing I want to do before I switch to full screen slides, though, is to give you this. Um, we have on our website some of the some resources that you will um, be able to access, and I just want to show you some of these. Um, in our uh, from our home page, you can get to this exciting biosolids and residuals recycling examples page, um, which has some uh, some programs that you'll well, I'll talk about today are shown here. Um, but these are some of the exemplary projects that we've worked on for a while, uh, or we've we've highlighted over the years and. Um, uh, there's many more that we could highlight here. We'd be glad to have you send your favorites, and we'll try to post them here. We want to continue to update these uh, exciting examples of how biosolids are used in many different ways. In this, in the member highlights section of our website, which is under the Nebra uh, uh, menu item, is um, there's information on our uh, member highlights. Uh, and this talks about some of the facilities, some of the programs that our members run. And some of these are outdated a little bit, but they're still relevant. Um, and they, they show you know, some of the great programs and benefits in our region. Um, and there are many more in other regions, of course, that you can look up and look around for on the internet. So. There's lots of um, member highlights uh, that we encourage you to look at. This one will be highlighted later, and um, this is one of the most impressive projects. I'm totally excited about it. The um, Making Asbestos Grow Impressive Conservation Land, or MAGIC, up in Quebec. And the Sustainability District, I like to call it, uh, Greater Lawrence Sanitary Treatment District, Sanitary District, in Massachusetts is making fertilizer, high grade quality fertilizer, as well as much energy in there, taking in outside food waste, uh, a spectacular story. And then if you look at our anaerobic digestion website, we'll be, um, the, there's some, um, this is on the resources pages of our, of our website. Um, there is a lot of uh, information there as well, sort of our favorites in terms of some of the, the value uh, values. So this is our resource center, and you just click on the anaerobic digestion page uh, to get to that. Um, this video by PBS about turning poop to power, for example, is a, is a classic back in 2016. So again, uh, please take advantage of the resources and the happy news around our website. So to continue then, here we go, fast ride. Consider that science, after having long groped about, now knows the most fecundating and the most efficacious of fertilizers is human manure. The Chinese let us confess it to our shame, knew it before us. Not a Chinese present, peasant goes to town without bringing back with him at the two extremes of his bamboo pole, two full buckets of what we designate as filth. There is no guano comparable in fertility with the detritus of a capital. A great city is the most mighty of dung makers. Fleets of vessels are dispatched at great expense to collect the dung of petrels and penguins at the South Pole and the incalculable element of opulence, which we have on hand here, we send to the sea. All the human and animal manure which the world wastes restored to the land instead of being cast into the water would suffice to nourish the world. Anybody know who that is? Of course, Victor Hugo, Les Miserables, 1862. So the knowledge of the power of poop was known very early. And here are some 
very recent examples of things that are happening. So the Magic Hat Brewery and the Essex Junction of Vermont treatment facilities in no Northwest uh, Vermont are both using anaerobic digestion, one to do the brewery waste, the other to do wastewater solids, creating electricity and energy or using these materials to generate electricity and returning the nutrients to the soil. Consider this, California now has a healthy soils initiative. This is an amazing thing, legislated for California, which is what, the sixth largest or ninth largest economy in the world. And they have these ambitious goals of reducing disposal of organic material to landfills, cutting methane emissions dramatically all within the next five years. 2025, I think, is the goal. Biosolids are positioned and are playing a key role in these major initiatives. All biosolids will be required to be recycled, essentially. The Marin Carbon Project, which is an exciting project, you should look up on the internet. It talks about the value of putting organic mass carbon back into the soil, and the San Francisco Biosolids, SFP, UC Biosolids, are part of that picture. There was a, here's a sort of sad bit of, you know, misunderstanding that, that we face here in our world of wastewater treatment. And here's an example of a connected news story where there was an accidental release of sewage to a, from, a, from a wastewater treatment facility. And the comment that came out was this, that stupid plant should never have been built, I always said, and this is exactly why. So the plant that is cleaning up the river and protecting the environment is misunderstood, dramatically in this case, but less so in, in other cases. What are our options for organic waste management? So biosolids are part of the larger pie of organic waste, and it includes yard waste and food waste, et cetera. So there are many different outlets that you can see here. Waste to energy has been used some, composting, of course, materials recycling, anaerobic digestion, and we'll talk about many of these and how biosolids are processed through them. Certainly you're all well aware of the fact that back in the day, sludge disposal was all that really mattered to wastewater facilities. It still is important and the primary goal of the wastewater facility is to clean the effluent and keep the water quality high. But using biosolids has now become the standard uh, by which most people measure success and resource recovery is really the goal for the future of wastewater treatment and biosolids management. So uh, this is old data now. We're up, we're working hopefully this year to complete up an update of this using 2018 data, but uh, we're seeing essentially still probably about half of the wastewater solids produced in the United States are recycled to land. And the beneficial use practices in use have been growing more and more towards class A, and we think that's probably still continued, so it's larger than this old data show, but agriculture still remains a major use of biosolids. And the percent of biosolids uh, recycled by different states and in different regions is shown by the intensity of the green here. The darker green are those states that recycle higher amounts of biosolids. These numbers have changed some since 2004, and we're looking forward to the update to see where those go. The markets for biosolids use and disposal are huge. Um, they're growing all the time and becoming more and more diverse. Agriculture remains a major outlet. But there's also horticulture and landscaping and turf uses of class A, uh, heat dried products and compost and other materials. There's topsoil blending uses of all kinds of biosolids and reclamation of disturbed sites is, is a critical use, one of the best around. And uh, there are specialized uses. And, and now we're talking again more and more about energy. Other art organics entering the marketplace are being incorporated and co-managed with biosolids, including fog, fats, oils, and grease. There are states that, as I said, have been implementing bans on disposal. Vermont and Massachusetts are in there with California. Um, there's a, there's a, a drive towards capturing enough energy to have net zero energy use at wastewater facilities. And then there's this wonderful work being done on urine diversion, perhaps being led now by the Rich Earth Institute in Vermont, uh, working with the University of Michigan as well. Here's just a snapshot of one region, 10 st states in the Northeast, and how biosolids fit into the larger picture of organic waste. And as we walk through these 
this discussion of the benefits of biosolids, many of the be same benefits apply to other organic wastes. Uh, food waste, certainly, uh, which is a, a significant portion of the waste stream, and then yard and leaf waste uh, materials. Here in the Northeast, we can see that the amounts recycled, um, yard and leaf waste is heavily recycled, pretty large amounts. Biosolids, maybe about a third to a half, and food waste is minimally. So more and more emphasis is being put on diverting food waste from landfills and getting it uh, mixed in with the other organics or process on its own. The recycling rates, yeah, <clears throat> are quite different. And there's plenty more recycling of biosolids that can be done. And what deserves recycling attention? It's very, very cool right now to talk about composting and processing of food residuals and diverting them from landfills. But it's a challenge, and it's challenging to accumulate and make clean products from food waste, especially that which is post-consumer or has those plastic contaminants and things in it. Whereas wastewater solids, we have plenty of it that's not being recycled, it's already accumulated, it, much of it's already dewatered and ready to go, and it's quite consistent in its quality and, uh, and in its low level of contamination of plastics and such. And all organic matter is organic matter. It varies in the amount of uh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio and how successful it is, but it all operates the same when it gets into landfills and when it gets into the soil. And that's an important thing to recognize. Biosolids is right in there with all these others. I like to think that biosolids, as Jeff Cooter coined the phrase uh, a few years ago, is the post-consumer recyclable food waste. We're talking about food waste recycling, but we've got biosolids which are post-consumer recyclable food waste. And why do we recycle? How do we get started recycling these materials? Because farmers love biosolids. They have worked. When back in the day, 50 years ago, when sludge was available at the local wastewater treatment plant, farmers learned to use it because it grew crops well. We can look at comparisons, and there are numerous research projects and demonstration projects that have shown this kind of thing where the root mass grown in biosolid soil is greater than that grown in fertilizers. That makes bigger, healthier plants. Biosolids use in agriculture, as I said, is, is the major use of biosolids still. Both Class B and Class A biosolids are applied to soils across the country. Why apply them? Again, to ensure the recycling of the nutrients in the biosolids going back to the soil and to help sustainability. There are examples. This is almost 30 years old, this picture of a hay field in New Hampshire here, where one application of biosolids increased the hay yield dramatically. And here is the you know classic kind of picture where that shows where you apply biosolids, it the grass is greener. That's just the way it works. Generally, our, our farmland is nutrient deficient, so we uh, need to try to return nutrients to the soil. If we don't do it through recycling organic matter, things like biosolids, then we're going to have to do it with uh, chemical fertilizers, which are much more expensive and, and uh, require many more resources and much more energy to produce. So here, especially in the Midwest, uh, both in the U.S. and Canada, we end up tapping a lot of the soil resources and taking a lot of the nutrients and exporting them to the coasts and other more populous areas. So we need to find ways to return the nutrients back to the soil. There are many nutrients in biosolids that are micronutrients that are not the major nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, and this is what sets apart biosolids from many other materials, including many composts. The, the, the variety of micronutrients, minor nutrients in biosolids are greater than any of the other soil amendments and materials. And that means that sometimes, for example, when I was out in uh, Oregon once and went to a nursery, we found, they found that the nickel in biosolids was holding back the growth of one of their plants. So, or the, the, the absence of nickel in the soil was holding back uh, the growth of their plants. So when biosolids were added with its traces of nickel, the plants did much better. So nutrient, uh, micronutrient values of biosolids are significant. 
And when we look at these organic amendments, uh, different kinds of manures, and we compare biosolids, they're going to have similar levels of, of uh, both uh, micronutrients and macronutrients. They're going to be different, and they have to be managed differently based on their quality. But, uh, but they all provide the same basic benefits, nutrients and organic matter. Dating back to the 1970s, we can have, we have such great stories to share. So this is a slide from research in the 1970s by Dr. Elliot Epstein and Dr. Rufus Cheney. Um, the, the, the corn growing on the right here is from, bi on biosolids amended soil. The other is the control. I'll mention at this point that Dr. Epstein has, uh, has died in, uh, recent weeks, and uh, we owe a lot to him and uh, these early pioneers who developed uh, composting systems and beneficial use of biosolids programs. Forestry is a major use of biosolids, um, especially in uh, the Northwest and in some in the Upper North, north uh, in the Upper Midwest. Um, but it does, uh, you know, it does some, some neat things if you can get the material applied within uh, fast growing stands of trees that are really farmed in a way, um, then you get things like this, where the biosolids is applied one time after about 20 years of growth of the sapling, and you apply biosolids one time, and that one time application leads to growth rings that are dramatically larger, a rate of growth much faster so that the, the foresters can manage the timber much more like crops, and that allows the economics to be such that, for example, in the Northwest, uh, the forest, the paper companies and, and pulp and uh, forest companies were willing to set aside and conserve other portions of their land because they could grow their trees faster on these farmed acres. There's much more organic uh, co-digestion going on or co-management, co co-composting. Des Moines, Iowa is a great example where they have done um, taking in a lot of the farm waste and, and uh, other food processing waste that uh, exist in that area from all the uh, agricultural operations around, and they're co-digesting uh, a great deal of material with their biosolids. Biosolids use is also great in horticulture and landscaping and turf, and we'll get a few glimpses of that as I go through here. This is one of the most exciting things for me personally because I can use biosolids, composts, and pellets on my home garden in my raspberries. And then just this winter, I'm showing you a few pictures here. We're putting the biosolids in mid-January, early January, to amend the soil in our high tunnel. And then uh, we, by, in February, we were able to plant um, the seeds for the spring crop, even though there's quite a bit of snow out there on the outside of the high tunnel. This is in central New Hampshire, so pretty cold climate in the winter. Uh, but by March, we're getting some uh, seedlings coming up, all kinds of greens and various things that grow slowly at that time of year, but they do grow, and then in May, they burst forth. And uh, this is what they look like. We're already eating them in April, small amounts, um, just called from these, uh, trans from these uh, seedlings. And then in May, we, we have huge amounts of uh, green, uh, all help with the biosolids. So now we've just planted our tomatoes in biosolids with biosolids compost as a soil amendment. This is cover crop that we uh, use as well to help improve the soil. But home gardens is a small use of biosolids compared to many, many others. And um, here's turf, a turf, turf grass used on sports fields. Some of the composts, uh, made from biosolids are used for some of the highest end sports fields and golf courses in the country. Here's an example of uh, uh, a Senator uh, uh, Angus King of uh, of Maine who uh, was a was prior governor. Sorry, these slides are moving ahead of me here. A prior governor who um, used biosolids showed, showed demonstrated biosolids compost on the lawn of the governor's mansion in Augusta. And a week later, a few weeks later, you can see the green stripe where you push the cart down. So again, there's visual evidence of biosolids value. And Boston here in our region um, makes a biosolids pellet fertilizer that's used all over the place, much of it in New England now. And we'll see some examples of that going forward. It's used on parks uh, and has been for many years since uh, the 90s uh, around the Boston area, as well as 
Uh, it's been used in the Midwest and in Florida and Colorado in the past. Most of it's used now in Massachusetts on agricultural land. Biosolids are used for topsoil blending. It's a, a way to bring organic matter and nutrients into uh, what might be a low-grade soil and, and build up the soil and make it more valuable and useful for all kinds of different uh, applications of soil. And then um, we have examples of biosolids, compost being used and other materials being used that are really spectacular for site reclamation. And we'll get into numerous examples of this. This, to me, is the, one of the most exciting ways to use biosolids. Um, if people have concerns about, you know, food, uh, direct food crop or food chain uses, here's ways to use biosolids, abundant amounts to restore disturbed sites that, that need something to reclaim them, need the organic matter, need the soil. And why not use the recycled material rather than stripping topsoil from somewhere else? So this is Spectacle Island in Boston Harbor, one of the Boston Harbor Park Islands. And this was an old landfill that has been capped with biosolids compost. And now it's a, a visitor attraction. It's a park that you can take a boat out to and explore. And uh, all the vegetation is supported with biosolids compost. Here are dramatic examples of what has been done with biosolids compost. This very coarse coal mine land area on the left is then revegetated with na native, uh, mature, native plants uh, to create this ecosystem, na natural ecosystem grows up out of this um, with just this one-time application, heavy application of biosolids and, and uh, in an engineered soil mix with, with other amendments included as well. This is a revegetated re coal mine spoil in Frostburg, Maryland. So some of the early research that was done on uh, revegetating disturbed sites with composted and other kinds of biosolids goes back. Love the hat in this picture. Um, this is another example of an early project in Palmerton, Pennsylvania, where the zinc smelters had basically just spoiled the landscape by distributing heavy metals uh, across the, up the hillside and causing a very low soil pH with the sulfur involved and uh, creating a dead landscape. Essentially, you can see all the dead trees here. This is what it looked like um, a few years later after the uh, biosolids material had been applied and uh, seeded and the revegetation happened, began to happen naturally. And not only are grasses growing in now, but so are trees and shrubs. And it's becoming a na natural native ecosystem. Interestingly, the Appalachian Trail corridor did not want biosolids applied because of concerns. So that is now continuing to serve as a control of what the old uh, sink smelter impacted landscape looks like today versus what the biosolids have managed to achieve. And this is in Colorado, a similar uh, kind of reclamation project, no, uh, mining um, debris and disturbance on the left uh, in Leadville, Colorado, I think it is. And uh, then the restoration that happens with biosolids. This is some of the work that Sally Brown did as part of her research. Land reclamation <clears throat> continues to be um, not a huge percentage of the amount of biosolids being used, but it's used in many different ways. Gravel pits in our region have been re reclaimed with this kind of uh, biosolids application. Gra sand and gravel mines are usually left uh, after they've been mined out with no topsoil. Um, so having some uh, material to create an engineered topsoil is very helpful. And reclamation continues to be in demand. This is some, an example in eastern Canada, in Quebec, um, where this, uh, this whole uh, mine spoils area is being greened up by, by ongoing work by Viridis and other uh, uh, biosolids management companies. And this is a uh, project, the MAGIC project that I mentioned earlier at Asbestos, Quebec, where um, you see the difference of uh, between what, what the old site looks like on the right and what the reclaimed areas look like on the left. This is acres and acres and acres of mine spoils from digging asbestos from a huge pit. And these mine spo spoils basically are ridges and plateaus all around the pit, and they're being revegetated now with biosolids and paper mill residuals and other organic materials. And again, this is very coarse material, very tough to manage and get vegetation to grow on, and the biosolids are working. This front, view, this view at the bottom here is all of an, a revegetated area that's several years old. 
these are photos from On Globe that's working on that project, and they have plans, and people are taking advantage of sort of the parkland that's being created by this uh, this activity. So parts of the uh, restoration areas that have been used for a while or uh, available for a while are now becoming parks. They're having activities here, and then this is an exciting thing that happened uh, last in the last couple of years. They basically here's the pit, the mine pit. Um, where the uh, all these the asbestos rock and the tailings were pulled out uh, to make the plateaus around, and they this is uh, one of the longest slack line uh, walks ever done was done was done there in Quebec. Um, so all kinds of uses and improvements of the landscape that help the local community, help the environment solve problems, not just uh, dispose of sludge. Biosolids can be used in many other ways, and, and this is uh, these are slides from Silvis, and Silvis is uh, mantra really. Uh, they're a company in Western Canada. Their mantra has been: biosolids are a tool to solve environmental issues, solve social issues, solve economic issues. So biosolids are a tool, not just something to get rid of. Biosolids use in energy. This is. Uh, Nashua, New Hampshire, and Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. These are um, one of, or a couple of several major projects all around the country that use uh, biogas. And the potential for biogas use has been shown by WERF and EPA and others, and, and the interest is growing and growing. If we can get more organic materials, including biosolids, into digesters and make green methane, essentially, and produce energy from it and produce fuels from it. Um, for transportation, even then, this is uh, this is a win-win-win. Many ways to use the renewable energy from biogas, and then there's another exciting way to look at energy use. Not only can you make biogas in anaerobic digesters, but Sally Brown and others, at, uh, Sally Brown University of Washington, many of you know of, uh, has done excellent work. And one of the, some of her projects has been looking at growing using fertilizers to grow energy crops. So here in the in the photo is a uh, canola crop, which produces a great deal of oil. So that crop is used for biodiesel production. So some of the King County trucks at the time were driving on bi biodiesel, using biodiesel that had been produced from the fields where the biosolids have been applied. So there's a circular sustainability loop there happening that's that's pretty exciting. And recently, uh, Sally wrote about and uh, had published uh, some research on switchgrass use of biosolids. Switchgrass is a potential energy ethanol crop that's more sustainable perhaps than using corn, um, and uh, biosolids could be a great fertilizer for that um, with lower uh, net greenhouse gas, em gas emissions. So I'm not going to take too much of a breath, but I'm going to continue on and talk a little more about the detailing these benefits. But here we go. Biosolids enhance soil health. They recycle nutrients that are that we need to manage because they're in that waste stream. Um, they bind contaminants, and this is something that uh, we forget to often to see as a benefit. So they're by putting organic matter into soils. For example, in urban gardening situations, if there's lead contamination, which is common in many urban soils, put biosolids and compost and other organic materials into the soil and you'll reduce the availability of that lead and other uh, metals in the soil. That doesn't mean there's less, and in fact, with biosolids, you're adding a bit more, but it means that the availability is reduced dramatically so that the plants will not take up the lead and, and will not transfer to the food um, food chain. Uh, also, the growth of vegetation that happens there is more robust, so that also dilutes the contaminants. Restoring degraded lands, boy, I've already talked about that and shown many of the benefits. Reducing fertilizer and pesticide use, um, we'll talk a little more about that. Carbon sequestration, very important, and I'll mention that some more too. And then there are economic benefits. Biosolids are something that have to be managed. Generally, the economics are that biosolids can be a lower cost alternative for farms and for others who are seeking fertilizer and soil amendments. Um, 
because the the cost of their production is essentially uh, um, supported by the wastewater facility operations. Um, using these materials will reduce greenhouse gas emissions in many cases. And these are materials that we have to manage. So let's look at uh, the soil health aspect. So organic matter is critical to conditions in the soil, and this is all well-established science. Organ you put organic matter in the soil, organic matter is carbon-containing material um, that is, ascent is, is a byproduct of life and of, uh, of, of things dying, essentially, uh, and the waste that, uh, organic, that uh, organisms produce. You put that organic matter into the soil, and there's nitrogen, there's carbon, and there's phosphorus, and there's other nutrients in it, but they are locked up into proteins and other complex molecules. So you need microbes healthy soil microbes to attack the organic matter and mineralize it and produce the nitrate which plants can then take up. Um, the, the cycle of nitrogen in the soil is critical and it is only possible if the soil is healthy and has plenty of organic matter uh, and the microbes needed. So improving soil fertility through the addition of organic matter residuals is a primary tenet of sustainable agriculture. You can't do it without. So that's why manures have been recycled forever. And this is the difference that you can see here in this soil in, from Pennsylvania. Here's what the soil looked like before. Here's what it looks like after. And again, this is a one-time biosolids application and a kind of reclamation process. And 18 years have passed. No further biosolids or other. But look, the organic matter that was added stimulated additional growth. And the plants die and build up more organic matter over time. Biosolids improve soils. University of Washington study here uh, looked at, uh, this is work again by Sally Brown. This is only one of many, many different kinds of studies that have been done. When you add the compost and other organic matter to soils, you increase the amount of organic matter in the soil. That makes total sense. Here are community garden plots. Cagro in uh, Tacoma, Washington is a well-known Biosolids product that's been around for many, many years and is widely used by everybody around the city. T Tacoma has the goal of having more community gardens than any other city per capita in the country. And so there's community gardens everywhere. And they all use Cagro, which is a fine biosolids product. Um, when after 10 years of gardening with uh, Tagro, you can see that the control compared to the Tagro amended soil. Uh, the Tagro amended soil has more carbon. So overall, a summary of this is this again from Sally Brown's work, and I rely heavily on a lot of what she's compiled here, obviously. Um, organic matter improves soil quality. The carbon, the amount of carbon can be multiplied not numerous times. That's important in the soil. That provides the energy for the microbial activity. Microbial activity increases. The water holding capacity increases. So if you're in a drought struck area, you need to add organic matter to the soil because it will help retain the limited water you have. Bulk density and the ability to manage the soil goes down when you add biosolids. Here's a facility in our, in northeast, our northeast area that produces tons of biosolids, the largest private composting operation in New England. And um, the cool thing about it is that it produces some fun, <laughs> some fun offshoots. One is that they always try to grow the biggest pumpkins around. And um, I just always like to add this little note about the Damers got a pumpkin fest. You need to go to that website, look it up, and watch how they are using pumpkins grown with biosolids compost and other people use other kinds of things. But these pumpkins are huge, and they uh, make little outboard uh, motor driven boats out of them and drive them across the harbor uh, in a little race every year. Consider this that um, when you look at sort of the advances and the understanding of um, of, of what uh, sustainable agriculture looks like, it involves things like cover cropping, low till um, or no till, and it includes recycling organic waste, returning organic waste to the soil. And this book by um, David Montgomery, shown here, Sally Brown, myself, um, Growing a Revolution, I highly recommend it. It has a chapter about 
using organic waste and biosolids included in uh, sustainable agriculture. Um, this is exciting stuff and it is the latest and current stuff. This is, leads to agriculture that does not require large chemical inputs or any in some cases that are well documented in this book. Think of all the benefits. I'm gonna run through so many benefits of composting and compost mat, mat, uh, compost addition to soils. Um, it suppresses, this is all researched and there's, there's papers you can find going back again 20, 30 years on this. Suppresses plant diseases and pests. Reduces the need for chemical fertilizers. Promotes higher yields of agricultural crops. You can cost effectively remediate soils contaminated by hazardous waste. Uh, again, binding up the uh, soil metals. There are so many uses that have been made. Again, this is Spectacle Island down here at the right. Merrimack compost that's been around for decades was is used on some of the highest end golf courses and has been used in Central Park in New York City. The value of the crop is improved uh, in terms of the nutritional value. So here in New England where um, horse hay has to have a high nutritional value, and that's true everywhere, right? But people pay close attention to the nutritional value of the hay. And the, the, the hays that are grown with biosolids, they tend to be really high in nutrients and things that are well, uh, well sought after because they have the nutrients from the biosolids. Just more documentation of the benefits. Intensive management systems that result in increased soil organic matter are a significant part of the solution. This is the kind of research that's been going on on greenhouse gas emissions for a long time. One of the goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is to restore organic matter to soil. And that is one of the major ways of reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And compost and biosolids have the carbon needed to help make that happen. Here's some, uh, again, some input. This is directly quoted from a recent uh, resource provided by Sally Brown. Uh, as part of our members, uh, me our member outreach, we provide uh, Sally Brown research articles and, uh, and her updates. And she said, you know, how do you sequester carbon in an urban setting? Well, the short answer is, you know, how effective is it? Um, using, even using uh, compost in an urban setting, you get some benefits of uh, storing carbon in the soil, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But the biggest benefit she found, and this is very detailed research, is that the new, when the, the, the best way to sequester the carbon in an urban setting is, for, is when a person comes with a large truck, uh, a new deve a developer of a, of a house lot and needs soil uh, around that house lot. And they use a, a good amount of biosolids to create a good healthy soil there around the house. Uh, and that uses and stores a lot of carbon. So that's the, the turf best case and, uh, and, and all that. So this is Ryan Bajaka, who is a, a now at San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. He did research with Sally Brown, again, comparing the results of uh, using different mixtures of biosolids, uh, looking at carbon sequestration and the benefits. So are you convinced? Compost is an important research bi resource. Biosolids composts have been used on the White House lawns in the past. Um, this is photos passed on to me by Elliot Epstein, and uh, yeah, they make grass grow. Let's look at some, we'll look at some um, other benefits uh, shown here, and I'm going to show some of these with a few, uh, right, with this slide and then with a few short videos. So um, this is work done by Andrew Carpenter uh, with Sally Brown involved as well, and uh, Niebuhr's involvement some. Um, but this is looking at uh, what happens when you do different types of management of biosolids with regards to gre net greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, it was modeled and calculated um, what happens in terms of having, if you landfill the biosolids, the same amount of biosolids versus incinerating them versus uh, incinerating with energy recovery and incinerating them at a somewhat higher temperature. And uh, these are all influenced by how much methane and how much nitrous oxide are released. 
as well as what kind of carbon storage happens, et cetera, and what kinds of methane uh, avoidance you, you get. So again, in, uh, in sort of this typical classic outcome, um, and, and when you look at uh, things equally, anaerobic digestion followed by land application, putting that carbon back into the soil, that organic matter back into the soil, has the lowest net uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, in, in a typical scenario. Of course, every local situation is different and you can do the calculation sum for each local thing. So I'm gonna uh, shift now to uh, showing you a few last items, which are, um, again, some of my favorite uh, little clips of videos. And I want to highlight that that uh, you know these are available um, I we will when we post this presentation I'll include the links to these videos but just listen to some of the testimony about the benefits of biosolids that are found in these videos so this this uh, and the next one are about or this one is about loop biosolids which as you probably know um, is the Seattle area biosolids, which uh, has had a lot of good public outreach and has developed some neat videos. Listen to this. Using loop as a fertilizer is the most economical choice for the county, but it also helps our entire community. By using it as a fertilizer, we're providing a full suite of nutrients to farms at a fraction of the price of synthetic fertilizer, which is helping to keep our farms economically sustainable. As a society, it's so rare that we have such a clear choice to make when the most environmentally sustainable, economically sustainable, and socially responsible choice all align. Using loop as a fertilizer and soil builder is the best choice for our community. So that is the loop biosolids. And this, uh, <clears throat> This will go talk about, so that one talked about the economics. You know, the, it, it is true. The economics are good. So it can be a win, win, win for all involved. Um, how does loop help our soil? This is a, a piece that talks about soil health and benefits, and, which we've talked about. Around the world, before. soils are being depleted of organic matter and carbon is being released as a greenhouse gas. Using biosolids such as loop helps us return carbon back to the soil and helping us to fight climate change. It also helps plants to grow bigger faster, which helps pull even more carbon out of the atmosphere. And it also is an alternate to synthetic fertilizer. Synthetic fertilizer requires a lot of energy to create. It also holds in water and produces amazing plants for our region. The coolest part about loop is that we are making it every day. So every time that you flush your toilet, you are making a donation to us to make a fertilizer to grow plants somewhere in the state of Washington. And I think that is probably the best story that we have when it comes to talking about our wastewater treatment process. So here's one from Bloom, which is the DC water um, uh, product that, uh, you know, they, they sort of built on the kind of effort that Loom did, uh, Loop did. We're reaching a tipping point where our ability to produce food with the increasing population uh, these things are coming to a hit. I know that that is a big problem. Like as our population increases, like what what are we going to do with all of our human waste? Biosolids is one way that we can do that. This product is in part the wave of the future, and in part something that's been well done already. We're now adding bloom. It is part of the future. The facilities like Blue Plains are not wastewater treatment facilities anymore. They're water reclamation plants or they're resource recovery facilities. Because for our ratepayers, for the environment, we've got to extract every bit of value that we can gain from nutrients, from energy, from other attributes of what had been considered a waste and turning it into assets and value for our ratepayers. And that is the future. And we're glad to be part of it here at DC Water. Here's an here
And here is uh, a little bit more about the bloom soil. But because it has such a high cation change capacity, it acted like a soil release fertilizer. Cation change capacity is like a sponge. It, it's able to hold nutrients in a form and make it available over the period of time. The plants are, are, are not only are they bigger, but the, the tissues are, are thicker. No, the taste is delicious. And that, if you don't know, was uh, a famous, uh, well-known uh, researcher from the University of Maryland. Um, and last, I'll show you, uh, I hope you've seen before, this Biosolids Naturally Sustainable video from, um, from the, put together by the Water Environment uh, Association of Ontario. Um, very, very much worth uh, watching. Um, there's some neat, uh, neat pieces in this. Um, I'll show you one that, you know, addresses the concerns we uh, hear about a lot, which is, you know, the, the trace contaminants. So all of these benefits are there. Heck, we forget to focus on those benefits enough because they are large, they are significant, they mean something, they, they're about sustainability. Um, but we get, and I know I spend much of my work life dealing with trace contaminants and other concerns that are significant and important to look at, and that's our job, but they are small concerns compared to the larger benefits, uh, I would say at this point. We have figured out the major, major concerns and how to address them. Those are pathogens which can kill people and heavy metals and such, and we're dealing with very small relative risks now, and it's important to do so, yes, but uh, as I say, they're overwhelmed some by these benefits. And one of the ways to look at contaminants that I always like to stress is that we need to look at the big picture. Um, what happens, we've seen a lot of big pictures today. Um, the benefits, you can see that these grow plants better, um, create healthy ecosystems. But what about what's happening in the soil? So but the question was asked, is this practice sustainable? Is it going to impact the soil that we're growing crops in, is it going to impact the crops at the end of the day? We took four different kinds of plants, corn, soya bean, the common green bean, and brassica rapa, which is field cover, and we took a look at various morphological development endpoints, when biosolids were land applied to them, and when in fact they were just grown in reference soil. But of course, this was not enough. What we had to also represent was kingdom animalia as well, and we did this then by taking a look at um, a major macroinvertebrate, springtails, and of course the common earthworm. If your municipal biosolids stress out these two organisms, what ends up happening is that you lose all of the fertility in your soil. But their environmental relevance is so extraordinarily important. What we found with all four plants, in fact, was that there were no morphological differences in anywhere along their um, life cycle development compared to reference plants. In fact, often the yield was uh, significantly higher in the crops grown in biosolids. With regards to the springtails, while it was tremendously onerous to count all of their offspring, we found that there was no statistically significant difference between those who were in biosolids and those in reference soil. And with regards to avoidance behavior, no, there were no significant differences. This was also true then for the earthworms. My research program is focused entirely on inorganic contaminants that enter soils as a result of agricultural practices. Okay, so that's that, and I would encourage you to check out our website if you want to see more stories, uh, and if you want to uh, uh, have uh, further information, we will be posting this, and hopefully the video will come out half decent. I'm sorry for stumbling on some things as I presented today. Um, I have so much, there's so much information, so many stories to share. Uh, and many of you, I know, can add to that plethora of stories and have your own that you'd like to share. We'd love to hear them. Um, please send pictures and, uh, and, and write-ups and things like that. We want to update our website with additional stories from all across the country, all across the continent. Thank you for joining, and uh, I'll open up to uh, any questions now, even though I know I've used up most of the hour. Glad to stay on and discuss. 
There was a question in the chat, Ned, and just to elaborate a little bit more, if you could, on how the biosolids bind the lead, for example, that you talked about. Right. So lead, uh, heavy metal binding, there's uh, lots of research that can be on that. Um, and glad to share that if uh, somebody wants to shoot an email to info at nebiosolids.org. Um, we can also, um, well, in, in general, um, what it is, it's a, a chemical complexing that happens with various constituents of the biosolids, particularly uh, lead, I mean, uh, iron and aluminum, for example, uh, basically bind with uh, many other binding sites in, that the biosolids bring. Um, so that the lead and other contaminants are, are, are bound into essentially with mineral particles. And that are very hard. It takes acid or something to uh, extract. So in a normal soil, uh, those will no longer be bioavailable. We can open it up to any other questions. Last minute here, about a minute or so. Yeah, Ned, this is Michael Kellerman. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I recently attended a, uh, a seminar at uh, Newtown Creek, and uh, Glenn Diger, who I have the utmost respect for, was talking about nutrient. And he made the comment that uh, he thinks the beneficial reach of biosolids is waning and will eventually go away. I don't know if you were aware that he took that position. But how do you address somebody like that who's so respected in the wastewater industry as, and how do you, you know, engage with somebody like that? Education. I think um, hopefully, you know, these, these kinds of presentations, um, we don't do them enough. And um, uh, I've done, you know, over, over many, many years, I've done a lot of presentations on a lot of different details but I I don't do enough of these. We don't we don't get people out in the field looking at real sites. We don't we en enough. Uh, I think I think that is uh, I think that perspective is wrong. I think there will always be a role of recycling. Um, I think well, some some engineers and some others technologists are focused on sort of higher tech answers and solutions. Those are fine uh, if we've got the money and and uh, the uh, expertise to pursue those and but um if it's not in the u.s there will be other places if, it, if it's not in more developed countries perhaps there will always be places that need to recycle biosolids in simple ways and there are uh, because it's uh, it's a necessity and it's economically um, viable to do simple application to soil uh plastic i think is underrated often it still is a major uh, use of biosolids, it comes with issues such as odors sometimes, but there are ways to manage that. And I, I point to example the, for example, to work done through uh, Water Research Foundation by the um, uh, Upper, the, uh, the Technology uh, University in Upper Michigan in the UP, uh, Northern Michigan University, I think it is, or Technology University. And uh, they work on a very simple process to make a class, uh, a high quality um, recyclable biosolids material through a, a sort of static process of, that involves freeze, freezing and thawing. So um, I think we just need to educate our peers always more and more. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Good to hear from you. So spread the word. I think we'll probably call it at that. It's been more a little over an hour. And Janine, thank you for organizing this and thank you all for your attendance and uh, participation. Um, please do send your success stories and share all the excitement you have about biosolid use. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank Ned. you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks yeah. for attending. See you all. Thank you. Bye, Terry. Bye, Terry.